Uh, Paul Graham, do you know if Radhika is still in the meeting? Pardon me? Do you know if Radhika is still in the meeting? Um, let me see. I I don't see her. Um, I'm sure she'll be back. <laughs> okay. I don't see her. Uh, I would suggest that we make a start and then... When uh, Radhika will have prepared some introductory remarks, so I suggest that I do a very quick introduction now and ask our first speaker, who will be Zhang Weiwei, um, to uh, to make his presentation. Uh, so on that basis, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for joining us today. Sorry for this slight confusion. Radhika, who's moderate, moderating our event today, um, for some reason has disappeared from the meeting, presumably having technical problems of some kind. Uh, but as you know, we're here to mark 10 years since the announcement of the Belt and Road Initiative, um, during which period more than 150 countries and international organizations have signed up to the strategy and upwards of a trillion dollars has been spent or committed so far for new infrastructure throughout Asia, throughout Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, the Middle East, and the Pacific. Um, it's a project which is having extraordinary consequences and ramifications and that's actively feeding into global development, into modernization, into connectedness, and increasingly is becoming a green project, a project for an ecological civilization, for sustainable development, um, for a safe and sustainable future for humanity. So, um, and it's, it's literally providing the physical infrastructure for a new, a multipolar, a pluripolar world characterized by fairness and equality in international relations. So um, very glad that you're all able to join us today. Thank you so much to, to our panelists and to all the audience members. I understand there's a huge volume of activities taking place today, today uh, particularly in relation to uh, the crisis in Gaza. Um, but nonetheless, what we're talking about is of uh, 
great importance and consequence. So thank you so much for joining. Uh, without any further ado, I'm gonna ask Professor Zhang Weiwei, who is a, a professor at Fudan University and a very respected and well, world-renowned voice in relation to all things China, politics, history, culture, and society. Thank you, Professor Zhang Weiwei. Um, and, and you would need to unmute. Is it okay? Can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much, Carlos, for your uh, kind introduction. Uh, indeed, uh, it's, um, uh, again, this backdrop of a crisis in Ukraine, in Gaza, and there are possible uh, ramifications for all kinds of uh, uh, crises uh, against overall background of this kind of chaos, we see BRM and its uh, implications. Uh, I was back from Beijing for this uh, 10 year anniversary summit. And uh, indeed I was impressed. I listened to so many speeches, which try to highlight this aspect in this chaotic world. We have this particular initiative and it represents that is certainty, peace, and development. <laughs> and today I'll share with you uh, my own thoughts on this huge uh, undertaking BRI. And I try to uh, make three uh, major uh, comments. Uh, the first is on the China's rise per se. Uh, as you know, uh, China now is the actually the world's largest economy in terms of purchasing power parity. That was the case since 2014. And this is the first time a socialist country has become the world's largest economy. And uh, with the world's largest middle class, uh, with the world's largest uh, consumer market, and uh, become the world's largest trading nation. And uh, so this is uh, really uh, meaningful uh, for China itself, uh, for the global South, and for the uh, reform of the existing international order. And I try to, as many people agree, to divide China into two uh, stages of development. First is what we call the first three decades since 1949. <clears throat> China, under the leadership of uh, Chairman Mao, laid the foundation <clears throat> for China's, excuse me, for China's dramatic rise. I call this the political foundation, economic foundation, social foundation. Political foundation is mainly the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party and the, a range of institutional arrangements from Chinese People's Congress to the United Front to political consultative conference. All these proved to be so essential for China's success. And economic foundation means uh, really China started with a very primitive uh, economic base now to a far more sophisticated uh, economic structure. But that foundation was laid back, you know, in the first three decades, especially comprehensive set of industries across the country. And these are important for China's success later on. For social foundation, I refer to the uh, women liberation and to a literacy movement, to basic health care system. All these were laid out and built up in the first three decades. And then roughly from 1978, when China entered this new year of reform and opening up, uh, what we see is economic takeoff. Uh, I try to use another uh, expression. I call China has successfully managed its rise in terms of uh, industrial revolutions. China has achieved four industrial revolutions in one. This is remarkable. In other words, roughly with the speed of every decade, every 10 years, China has gone through one industrial revolution. The first one focusing on trade, and producing production of uh, textiles and small rural enterprises. And that was achieved roughly by the year uh, uh, 1995. Uh, then the second industrial revolution focusing on power industry, manufacturing industry, 
again within 10 years by 2010, China became the world's largest producer of uh, energy, power, electricity, and then other manufactured goods. And then third industrial revolution, that's the telecommunications. And then China now is in the first, <clears throat> uh, how should I say, in the uh, frontier of the fourth industrial revolution uh, in big data, AI, and quantum technology, and uh, certainly renewable uh, energies. So this is amazing uh, for China's achievement. And that's my uh, first uh, point concerning the overall rise of China. Now, <clears throat> my second point concerning the implication of this kind of rise or four industrial revolutions in one, which means China is arguably the only country, at least large socialist country, that has successfully broken away from the what we all call the unjust international order, what's called the peripheral central world order. And China has broken away from this dependency on the West. And with these four industrial revolutions in one, China itself has become a center. It is simultaneously largest partner with the peripheral country, developing countries, and with the Western country, the center countries, in terms of trade, uh, investment, technology, and other aspects of the economy. So this itself is uh, uh, fascinating. In many ways, uh, back in 2018, when the United States imposed trade war on China, imposed tech war on China, uh, I myself and my institute were the first among the very few in China to say the United States is going to lose trade war with China, is going to lose the tech war with China. Now, five years have elapsed. You can see very clearly the United States has lost trade war. Uh, 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 as we can see with all the statistics uh, over the past five years, 90 to 95% of the increased tariff were paid by the U.S. companies and customers. So the United States now has inflation. And uh, for tech war as well, uh, we see the Huawei's uh, <laughs> Made 60. <laughs> uh, it's a breakthrough, uh, which also means the United States lost the tech war. And uh, so this has tremendous implications for uh, the uh, BRI. So when that comes to my uh, third point, uh, the BI itself, uh, I try to uh, uh, highlight my thoughts uh, from the two angles. First is hard power for BI and then soft power for BI. In terms of hard power, uh, China is the, indeed the only country now uh, capable of providing goods, services, experiences from all the four industrial revolutions to global south, to countries participating in the BI. No other country can do that. Uh, for one thing, why United States lost trade war? Because we calculated, yes, sun US trade will suffer. Uh, it suffered in the first one and two years. But the China trade with Africa, with uh, Europe, with ASEAN increased often in double digit growth. So no problem, no. So China's overall trade is situation better than before. And uh, then, if you look at the, uh, with these four industrial revolutions uh, in one, China is uh, the only country that is capable of providing what I call total solution uh, to industrialization for many developing countries. For instance, uh, China has built uh, 6,000 kilometers uh, railway and then same lands of highway uh, for African countries. And uh, China has built in two years, within two years, the whole uh, complete uh, petrochemical industry facilities for countries like Chad, uh, like Uzbekistan, 
uh, etc. Uh, so this kind of total solution is very important. So it's not only uh, traditional infrastructure, but also digital infrastructure, a uh, green infrastructure. Uh, China can do all that. Uh, this is a remarkable that changed global uh, outlook and also prospect of developing countries. And uh, <clears throat> furthermore, China is also uh, in terms of um, uh, soft power for the BRI. Uh, the most famous principle is Gong Shang Gong Jian Gong Xiang, which literally uh, should be translated into uh, discussing together, uh, building together, and benefiting together. I think this is a better translation than other translations. And uh, <clears throat> it's aligned well with Chinese. And these ideas are from Chinese uh, industrialization and modernization, and also from the Chinese civilization. And they are very socialist in one way or another. Discussing together is from uh, what we call consultative democracy, which was extensively used in China's rise. I said in both high politics and low politics. In high politics, China produced five-year plan one after another through hundreds of rounds of consultations within the party, outside the party, within think tanks, outside think tanks, and with the society. So each five-year plan is the output of uh, sophisticated institutionalized consultations with all parties concerned. For instance, now China is the leader in uh, renewable energies, in electric cars, but this is the result of uh, four, uh, four consecutive five-year plans with all kinds of minor readjustments in the process. Otherwise, it's inconceivable. So this is what I call consultative, consultative democracy in high politics. Then in politics, uh, as uh, we Chinese, in Chinese culture, we have this consultative culture. Uh, many of you have been to China many times, and many of you use WeChat. The Chinese have experienced this WeChat revolution. And it's actually the Chinese way of uh, freedom of speech and uh, uh, freedom of assembly, indeed. You can form a group immediately. You can form three groups, five groups, any any time uh, within one day or within half a day. Uh, far less concerned about what people in the West would call uh, privacy. Uh, I said we are more open-minded in many ways because there are many things we should discuss in daily life, in uh, in business, in, in office uh, work, etc. So in both in high politics and in low politics. So in BI, we say discussing together with all the parties, including business parties, political personalities, even among uh, people, different political parties within that particular participating country. And building together is also a reflection of Chinese, what we call the down-to-earth, the pragmatic spirit. I was in South Africa uh, a few months ago uh, during this uh, summit, uh, a BRIC summit, and uh, uh, I was told that uh, in Africa, people have a description for Western uh, projects. It's called the NATO, uh, no action and talk only. <laughs> so... Uh, China is just opposite. Uh, we reach consensus and then immediately it's put into operation. Uh, and we emphasize efficiency. You have to be completed against whatever the schedules uh, worked out. Uh, kind of down to earth uh, pragmatism and uh, can do spirit. And for the benefiting together as well. You know, I always say uh, BI is not a charity. Uh, yes, China provides aid, uh, aid project to uh, many developing countries. Uh, this is true. But uh, for a such an undertaking to be uh, able to last and continue to uh, work, it has to be commercially viable. Uh, from our calculation uh, up to now, 80% of Chinese enterprises are private enterprises working in uh, the BI initiative. State-owned enterprises play their role private ones play zero and the two roles complementary. They're not always perfect ideal as with any situation, any country, there are problems, this or that. But overwhelmingly speaking, uh, largely uh, they are uh, more successful than uh, other prof uh, uh, projects. So benefiting together is indeed true. 
So uh, in summary, with this kind of um, uh, four industrial revolutions in one, and with this uh, uh, hard power and soft power of the BRI, I think uh, now Global South, including all the participating countries of BRI, over 150 now, uh, we can really promote in a meaningful way the reform of the existing unjust uh, unipolar world order into something far more multipolar and far more beneficial for the vast majorities of the world's populations. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Zhang, uh, for your really enlightening uh, uh, opening speech detailing um, uh, uh, particularly the concept of the four industrial revolutions, which was really illuminating. Um, first of all, let me say that I'm very sorry. I'm the moderator of this event. My name is Radhika Desa, and I'm sorry to have um, uh, 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 arrived so late. We are moving big time, and our carpenter just unplugged the modem unknowingly, of course. So hence the disruption. But uh, let me just restart the event uh, and give you a little bit of my introduction. So first of all, let me welcome everyone, uh, the speakers and all the audience to this webinar on building the multipolar world, 10 years of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, it's a co-sponsored initiative of Friends of Socialist China, which is a platform based on supporting the People's Republic of China and promoting understanding of Chinese Socialism and the International Manifesto Group, which was created as a discussion group at the start of the pandemic to discuss the unfolding of the multiplying broader economic, social and political and international crisis. It was clearly accelerating and though our work and its relevance have only increased as the world has since been plunged into many more crises crises up to and including the horrific events still unfolding in Gaza. My name is Radhika Desai, I convene the Manifesto Group. And I would like to also add that we have a very large number of co-sponsors signifying to the importance of this event. They include Connolly Books, Critical Theory Workshop, the Geopolitical Economy Research Group, Geopolitical Economy Report, the Hampton Institute, the International Action Center, Iskra Press, uh, Corsetune News, Peace, Land and Bread, Pivot to Peace, uh, and Veterans for Peace China Working Group. So please check out all these groups and their websites. Um, I think perhaps the best way to introduce this, and Professor Zhang has already anticipated some of what I'm going to say, but the best way to introduce this webinar is to point out that humanity has never before stood at a starker choice. And the Belt and Road Initiative as the flagship program of Socialist China's international engagement with its inclusive and developmental goals, an ever-expanding circle of participants, beneficiaries, and friends represents one of the two stark choices. The other choice is the ever-shrinking US-led exclusionary coalition based on illusory distinctions between an in-group that call themselves democracies when in fact they resemble little more than plutocracies and an out-group that are labeled autocracies and dehumanized in preparation for all sorts of assaults, economic, political, sanctions, military, etc., no matter how much development they bring their people. The world is being forced to make this choice by the United States, but the very actions that the US is undertaking to buttress its definition of the choice is making a no-brainer choice for the world, not just to reject the US alternative, but increasingly to fight it. Nothing illustrates this better than the juxtaposition that we witnessed in early October of President Biden aiding the most brutal assault of the Palestinian people ever, and President Xi celebrating the 10th anniversary of the BRI with so many leaders in attendance and by announcing the lines along which it will now unfold. For the past months, the people of Gaza have been victims of a brutal and unrelenting and entirely illegal 
a, a, a barrage of collective punishment, which is being waged by Israel and supported by the United States. Thousands of Palestinians, nearly 10,000, have now lost their lives, and overwhelmingly, they are women and children. I believe 40% of the victims are to children. Gazans are being deprived of that most critical of human necessities, namely water. They are being starved. They are being forced into unsanitary conditions and disease and deprived even of the most basic medical help when both disease and injury are vastly increasing the need for that, for both. The images and facts of the injury and grief simply deaden the mind. Still, the United States will not call for a ceasefire, intoning the mantra of Israel's right to defend itself, and even defeating United Nations Security Council resolutions asking us it merely to pause uh, 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 the fighting rather than just end it. The vast majority of the world looks on in horror. It asks if the Palestinians do not have the right to resist the increasingly brutal occupation of their lands, which, by the way, in international law, they do. And the world demands an immediate ceasefire and a negotiated solution to the 75-year-old conflict caused by the Western-backed occupation of Palestine. The current war is the uh, 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 the current war uh, which the U.S. is increasingly helping in Israel aggravate is only the latest in a series of wars the United States has either initiated or provoked or aggravated in a long and bloody history of seeking to subordinate other countries with a one size fits all policy paradigm. It is dressed up in the rhetoric of human rights and democracy, but its real purpose is to open up other economies for the benefit of American and Western corporations uh, uh, for, for, to, to expand their capacities to exploit these countries. It is a long and bloody history, therefore, of imperialism. On the other side of the Eurasian landmass, President Xi celebrated 10 years of the Belt and Road Initiative, through which China has expanded development cooperation around the world, built infrastructure, supported a green transition, offered capital, skills, technology to countries around the world on the basis of win-win, mutually agreed cooperation among countries that are, this is most important, free to choose their own path of development and increasingly doing so. And President Xi also added uh, to, uh, uh, in, in his remarks, also referred to eight different ways in which the Belt and Road Initiative will continue to expand the future, which includes increasing connectivity via air, road, uh, road uh, uh, sea, uh, uh, increasing the possibilities of digital uh, uh, technology and the availability of e-commerce, small, smart and small livelihood projects, and many, many other things. So in this context, the West's relentless efforts to argue that the BRI and other initiatives that China has undertaken are just like, if not worse than the imperialism that they have inflicted on the world for the past several centuries, uh, is simply exposed as completely false. They argue that China is engaging in debt trap diplomacy, does not invest in industry, but is only interested in resources, does not create employment, but only brings his own workers. All these accusations have simply been shrugged off, not just by China, but by the world, which is joining China in increasing numbers. So today, to help us to understand how the BRI is building the multipolar world, rejecting unipolarity and hegemonism, as China rightly calls it, uh, uh, and, and, and in, in reacting to the increasingly repulsive character of the U.S.'s world role uh, as represented by the suffering of Gazans, is uh, uh, we have a really uh, uh, interesting panel, a very wonderful panel, and you've already heard the first uh, extremely uh, important uh, intervention. So we will now go to the second one. Uh, uh, Li Jingjing uh, is our next speaker, and she's a reporter for CGTN and a well-known figure to those that follow the Chinese media. She has traveled throughout China, 
doing English language video journalism and providing the outside world with a ground level view of life, particularly in the autonomous regions and among ethnic minorities. Her interviews and videos are absolutely uh, beautiful and absorbing to watch. She has interviewed Uyghur Islamic scholars in Xinjiang and school children in Tibet. She spent February and March 2020 in Wuhan covering China's COVID frontline for CGTN. So Jingjing, Jing, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Radhika, for your wonderful introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining this webinar. It's such a great honor to be among these amazing, distinguished guests to discuss how to build common prosperity for all of us, especially when the world is facing unprecedented struggles. So in September, I had the chance to travel to different countries to see some of the BRI projects firsthand and conduct interviews with local people. I went to Pakistan. Greece, Tanzania. But whether people from Asia, Europe, or Africa, they all said one same thing to me. China was the only country that came to invest when no one else wanted to. So all those critics from the Western world who keep telling BRI countries not to trust China, don't let China invest in your country. Then why didn't you invest? Well, I ask locals, what, uh, do they think BRI is just doing railway colonialism? Do you think what China is doing is imperialism like the West accused? They all said, oh, I think we know very well what is imperialism, what is colonialism. And Chinese people are definitely treating us differently. And we don't feel the need to be told by the West what is colonialism. So whichever BRI country I went to, local people treated me with like warmly with great hospitality, even when I was just randomly walking on the streets or chilling at a tourist spot, locals will come to me uh, to shake my hands or take selfies with me. When in Pakistan, local people, completely strangers, will to tell me, Pak China Zindaba, that's Urdu, means Pakistan Chinese friendship forever. While I was in Tanzania, when they find out I'm Chinese, they all start to say how much they love Chairman Mao. They show me great welcome and respect, not because I'm some like fascinating person. No, I'm not that narcissistic. It's because of the generations of Chinese workers, uh, engineers, and experts who brought all those infrastructures to their hometowns and brought tangible benefits to them. That builds a reputation for Chinese people. So wherever we go, Local people treat us as families. Now, when we talk about Belt and Road Initiative, we have to talk about infrastructure. What can infrastructure bring? Let me tell you what I and many Chinese people have gone through. So 25 years ago, when I was a kid living in the Hebei province, it took me, it took me a day and a half by train to go to a neighboring country called Henan province to visit my parents who were then back then working there. These two are neighboring countries, 945 kilometers away. I thought, damn, why it took so such a long time to visit a neighboring country? But when I went to university, I found out my story was nothing compared to my classmates from Xinjiang. They chose not to go back home during the one month long winter vacation because it would take seven to 10 days for them on the road, single journey, by train, car, or probably cattle cart combined. And for some villagers in Southern Xinjiang, it used to take them seven days on foot to move to another city in the same province, just because the world's second largest shifting desert, the Takilamagan Desert, lay between the two cities. But two decades later, things completely changed after massive infrastructure network was built in China. Once the journey took me a day and a half, now it only takes me three hours by high-speed rail. It only takes five hours by plane flying from Beijing to Xinjiang. And people live around the Takilamaga Desert can also move around easily because a railway that circles the entire desert was built. I don't know how many airports are there just in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Just in Xinjiang region alone, there are 25 airports. 
and they will build seven more in Xinjiang. So to this year, China has built 155,000 kilometers long railways. And among those, 42,000 are high-speed rail, ranked number one in the world. With infrastructure like this, millions of villagers, Chinese people who, who once were trapped in the mountains in the deserts could get out of the mountains and be connected with the rest of China. These infrastructures played a crucial role in lifting the 800 million Chinese people out of extreme poverty. The reason I mention these stories is because through our experience, we believe in the power of infrastructure. Infrastructure like railways, bridges, and roads have the power to catalyze economic activity. We have an old saying in China, 要想富, 先修路, means if you want to get rich, build roads first. And China did it. And now China has been sharing this know-how with other developing nations, uh, Global South countries, who have been for centuries denied the right to have these infrastructures. Take Africa as an example. China has helped to build more than 6,000 kilometers of railways and roads, developed 20 ports and more than 80 large power facilities across the African continent. I know we have a speaker from Zambia who will tell us more about the perspective from Africa, my friend Fred Mambi. I will just share my humble opinion, my humble observations first. Now, suddenly the West is all eyes on China-Africa relations, right? Thinking it's just the China trapping Africa since now China is rich. But no, the friendship between China and Africa didn't just start today. They were sworn friends since decades ago. Two months ago, I went to Tanzania. I took a ride of the Tazara Railway, which is a railway connecting Tanzania and Zambia. It was the first project that China aided in Africa in 1970. And that's a symbol of China-Africa brotherhood. The railway was also referred to as Freedom Railway because it helped countries in Africa to win national independence movements. So when China aided Zambia and Tanzania to build that, ray, that, that railway, you know, that was in the 1970s. China itself was very underdeveloped, but it still provided whatever it could offer to build that road. So Chairman, Chairman Mao back then said, we see Asia, Africa, and Latin America's victory against imperialism and colonialism as our own victory. Those people who already won the victory should assist the people who are still fighting for liberation. All countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, if they need our help, we are willing to provide it. That's Chairman Mao said in the 70s, in the 60s. And that's how China and Africa started their friendship, assisting each other. And now we see some history repeats. What happened then is very similar to what's happening now, because back then, the United Kingdom, the United States, Soviet Union, those big powers were all invited to build that railway, but they all declined. World Bank, World Bank also declined to give loans to Zambia and Tanzania because building that railway requires too much investments, either money-wise or human resources-wise. And they don't think it will bring much in, uh, it, it will bring back enough profits. So they all declined to help. Zambia and Tanzania. So China stepped in. Chairman Mao expressed the willingness, discussed with Tanzania's Kuwenda and Zambia's Nerede several times, and decided to provide all round assistance from exploration, design, construction to interest free loans. You know, but the UK and the US, the UK and the US didn't want Ch Tanzania and Zambia to work with China either, even though they themselves didn't want to help them. They didn't want to see those countries work with others. So what did they do? They smear. They were just like the toxic ex. Talk bad about you. So huge smear campaigns began after the three countries started this cooperation. Some British media would poke fun at China, believing the real track would be made of bamboo since China has lots of bamboo. And many scholars in the US believe China lack of ability to build railways since it was so underdeveloped. But funny enough, 
The thing that the rich developed Western countries didn't want to do was successfully completed by the underdeveloped China. Decades later, the tactics haven't changed. After seeing more and more countries joining the Belt and Road, 150 countries now, seeing more and more countries choose to work with China, we are seeing another huge smear campaign, like the so-called narrative. Hmm? One minute. Oh, no. Let's <laughs> do so much to say. Okay. I will try to speak very fast. The dead trap narrative. Uh, take, take two, please. Okay. It was the debt, even though it was the debt from the Western institutions that trapped these nations. And, uh, but when we talk about smear campaigns, we have to mention the biggest lie in this smear campaign. It's a lie about Xinjiang. In many Western p- countries, politicians have expressed huge concerns about the Muslim community in Xinjiang. And then we have to ask, why don't they care about the Muslim communities in Iraq, in Syria, in Palestine, who are being bombed on a daily basis now? But they specifically care so much about the Muslim communities in China's Xinjiang. And on the day that the bomb dropped on the Gaza, the UK's foreign Ministry of Foreign Affairs expressed their concerns for human rights, but not in Gaza, in Xinjiang again. How funny. So their tactic uh, one, on one way, they want to drive a wedge between China and the Muslim countries. But we, this campaign is also going after the Belt and Road Initiative because Xinjiang's location has strategic significance in boosting economic and trade integration between Xinjiang and Central Asia, West Asia, and Europe. Xinjiang shares borders with eight countries, Asia, in uh, Mongolia, uh, Russia, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Pakistan, India, eight countries. So, and also there is a China-Pakistan economic corridor starts from Xinjiang going through Pakistan. And there's a China-Europe freight railway starts from going through Xinjiang and then connecting the whole Europe. You can take a look at the map since I don't have enough time to show you the map. (laughs) So Xinjiang is the gateway of the Belt and Road Initiative. Hundreds of billions of dollars in imports and exports trade volumes go through Xinjiang. It's a vital place for BRI and a vital place for connecting the whole Eurasia. And it's a vital place finally bringing solidarity, stability, and prosperity to Eurasia. This land has been seen as a chessboard for imperial powers to gain their own geopolitical gains. So luckily, this smear campaign is not winning because just a few days ago, China doubles down on developing Xinjiang by making it a pilot free trade zone. That means more opportunities for international corporations on trade, business, technology, culture, education will be in Xinjiang. It will stabilize Eurasia. Last month, the some world leaders flew to the other side of the world to discuss how to continue bombing children, hospitals, ambulance. It's devastating for all of us to see the soul crushing consequences of the conflicts. But also, exactly the same month, 4,000 guests from over 140 countries gathered in this part of the world to conduct more cooperation, sign new deals, make new friends, find ways for win-win cooperation, and no more zero-sum game. And that's what we need, building common prosperity. And BRI can make it happen. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jingjing. That was really a very energizing, as usual, uh, presentation, and 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 really, uh, I think uh, it hits the goes to the core crux of the issue, which is the centrality of patient long term infrastructure investment that can only which can bring development. So thanks very much. Um, our next speaker is Eric Solheim, uh, who is the former UN Environment Executive Director and Under Secretary General of the United. United Nations, as well as Norwegian Minister for Environment and International Development from 2005 to 2012, and Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program from 2016 to 2018. He is currently President of the Green Belt and Road Institute. There are very few people in the world who have such an impressive record of advocacy for climate justice, sustainability, and green development. Eric is a consistent friend of the Global South and devotes a great deal of energy to understanding, encouraging, and promoting China's efforts to build an ecological civilization. So I don't think we will have a more authoritative expert than him to speak about the ecological aspects of the BRI. Eric, please go ahead.
then I was unmuted, I think. Th th thank you so much. And let me build upon what Jinjing said and take you to Mombasa, Kenya. That's a fairly poor African town. If you travel through Mombasa, you see a lot of poverty. There's no lack of garbage in the streets, and it's a fairly rundown place. And then you come to an oasis, which is absolutely green, clean, and wonderful. And that is the end station of the Mombasa Nairobi Railroad, built, of course, by Kenyans, but with money and instructions and supervising from China. Uh, it shows the future of Kenya. And it's simply absolutely wonderful as an example of what Belt and Road brings. As I can see, the 10 years of Belt and Road has been an astonishing success. The background color for Belt and Road is now green. And Belt and Road is by far the most important green investment initiative in our era. Uh, let me point to the two main, I mean, of course, it's also a lot more. It's, it promotes peace, it promotes development. It's a win-win initiative where 150 countries can win in cooperation with China. But let me focus on the green aspects. And there are two main ways. Belt and Road is enormously beneficial to the, way, uh, to the future going green. One is green corridors like the Mombasa and Nairobi Railroad. And I really hope that they can, can be continued to Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi. It's a wonderfully beautiful landlocked African countries. We should benefit a lot if they can be connected to the port of Mombasa. And also the railroad can of course bring a lot more tourists to these, these countries. But the Kenya and Mombasa is one. Uh, the suburb of Djibouti is another one. Uh, just two weeks ago, the Bandung uh, Jakarta Railroad in, in, uh, in uh, Indonesia was open. Hopefully that can continue to Surabaya in the near future. And of course the Yunnan um, um, Laos Railroad bringing the landlocked pure, uh, in a, uh, pure Asian nation of Laos into connections with the Chinese rail network, but in reality with the China Europe rail network. So you can produce something in Vientiane and sell it in Germany or Spain through this uh, connection. These are wonderful yes. green connectivity, very beneficial to yep. the world. The second area uh, is uh, green uh, in energy. And of course, the watershed moment was when President Xi in 2021 said that China would stop overseas coal investment. Because when that happened, well, of course, immediately Kenya, Ethiopia, Vietnam, Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh all started to say, well, we are not sure we, don't, we need any future coal investment. Let's go for solar, for wind, for hydropower, all these energies that China can provide through investment and, of course, through exchange of best practice. China is now the world leader on everything green. This is not really realized in the West, uh, but uh, that's just of the, that's just the Western arrogance and of course the enormously negative campaign by many Western media. Look, 60 to 80 percent of every green technology is now employed in one country alone. 60 percent of solar or wind or hydropower, electric batteries, electric cars, electric buses, high-speed rail. China is between 6 and 80 percent of all this, one country alone. And of course, the biggest companies in all these sectors are Chinese, whether it's Longi in solar or it's CITL in electric batteries. And the power to invest and help other nations is enormous. What's maybe not so much realized is that China has also moved from the back seat to the front seat of environment protection. Look, 10 years ago, I would never go jogging in Beijing. There was horrible pollution. When you spoke to people there, they would say, yes, I'm happy with economic development, but I want to see the sun, or I want to see the blue skies. And that's now delivered. Uh, th these days, I would be happily go jogging in Beijing because you can see the blue skies and the sun. And basically, the war on pollution is won in China. And China has moved from the back seat to the front seat on everything related to environment protection. China is without any competition, the biggest tree planter in the world. China is now embarking upon the biggest national park system in the world, focused on Qinghai and, and Tibet in the West, but also like, say, Giant Panda National Park in Sichuan, where the number of giant pandas coming up by the day. 
thanks to good conservation work. And very, very recently, President Xi went to Guangdong, uh, where he visited a mangrove park. I would love to see Biden or Scholz or Macron or every Western leader, please go to mangroves. Well, that's so essential to the future of humanity. It's a protection against waves and one of the most vibrant ecosystems anywhere. And he spoke about the importance of mangroves and China has now set up a in intention for best global practice on mangroves. So whether it's technologies or it's best environment practice, China is either the lead nation or one of the lead nations in the world and has a lot to offer. And Belt and Road is the perfect model for cooperation on all these. Then we are all aware that there are Western criticisms. But largely, these criticisms are fairly easy to refute. I mean, I think there are three categories. One is Belt and Road brings depth in depthedness. And yes, indeed, depth is a real issue. And we should not promote that. But there is a lot more depth, uh, depth from developing countries to the West. So if the West has some criticism here, please put up a mirror, look yourself into the mirror, and when that's done, you can go on criticizing someone else. And for example, Indonesia, uh, uh, Sri Lanka, which I'm very close to, I'm a good friend of the president, Rani Vikramasinghe, it just went to China to thank China for the depth restructuring China has provided to Sri Lanka in the midst of the economic crisis there. And that will also hopefully help the, so that India the, and the West the International Monetary Fund will do the same. So the debt issue is not a Chinese issue, it's a global serious issue, but mainly focused on the West. Second criticism was that Belt and Road was grey, focusing on coal and, uh, and gold and gas. And that criticism, there was some truth in that in the very beginning. But after decisions to stop all overseas coal investment, this now Belt and Road is the greenest uh, in, in, um, investment uh, initiative in our era. We have significant uh, power to make the world go in green. And the third criticism is that Belt and Road is a kind of a Chinese power play. And of course, yes, China gets a good name through Belt and Road. Many nations are coming closer to China through Belt and Road. But by the way, that's exactly the aim of American and Western aid also, to link nations closer to themselves and to get a good word in the name, uh, uh, word in the, in, in the world. So there's no difference from China doing this uh, or the West doing it. I mean, the most uh, famous of all American help initiatives in the entire world, the so-called Marshall Help in the 1950s, was all about this, to make China, no, sorry, make America more powerful through economic cooperation with other nations. So this criticism simply basically fall flat. But the main answer to Western criticism in my view is very simple. Please do better. If you have some criticism of China, please do better. I mean, every nation in Africa would love to see better Western uh, initiatives competing with Belt and Road. If you are the president of Tanzania or Zambia or Nigeria or, or, or Ethiopia, wherever, what you want is a close relationship to both China and to the West. And if someone is finger pointing to Chinese initiatives, the answer is very simple. Please do better. Then everyone will be happy. But so far, all... Um, <clears throat> I think Eric is frozen. Please come up with a better ah, alternative. Yes. Just finally, uh, the West should think more of how we can complement China rather than how we can compete with China. Look, China has produced 40,000 kilometers of high-speed rail just since Beijing Olympics in 2008, 15 years. 40,000 kilometer of high speed rail. The United States of America has produced exactly zero kilometers of high speed rail in the 200 years of history of that nation. So, how likely is it that the United States can produce high speed rail in Africa or in the Middle East better than China? I think we all understand the answer to that. What you can do very well at home, you are more likely 
to do in other parts of the world. So why don't the United States look into areas where they can complement China, where they have assets which are better than China. For instance, during COVID, maybe the American companies were in the forefront of developing the vaccines. Why don't the United States help Africa to set up vaccine centers all of Africa to produce affordable vaccines for the poor so that we can be prepared if a future uh, catastrophe. Uh, okay, I guess we've lost him again, but since he was uh, just concluding, I will uh, take over from here. Maybe if he really wants, we can give him a chance to come back and make any final point he wants to make. Um, so thanks very much to Eric for his uh, really enlightening uh, speech, particularly emphasizing and removing so many of the misconceptions that hang that still hang around um, uh, China's ecological record, particularly and uh, chiefly thanks to U.S. Uh, 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 US uh, propaganda. Uh, we were going to take Senator Mushahid Hussein next, but Senator, with your permission, I will skip to Sayyid Mohammed Marandi because he has uh, a, a very tight schedule and must leave in about 20 minutes. So he will speak to us for 10, 12 minutes and then leave. So I will introduce him first. Thanks so much. Uh, Senator, uh, Senator Hussein. Um, okay, so Sayyid Mohammed Marandi is our next speaker. He is professor of North American Studies and teaches in the Faculty of World Studies at the University of Tehran. He has published widely on a range of topics and appears regularly as a political and social commentator on international networks such as Al Jazeera, Press TV, RTV, sorry, RT, CGTN, as well as CNN and BBC. So, Professor Marandi, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I'd like to apologize to the senator for uh, taking his slot. Um, I think it's quite obvious uh, that what the United States has been trying to do over the past few decades for those of us who've lived a bit longer, uh, is that it's been trying to contain other countries, to manage the world, to make sure that it is in charge of the globe, it and its allies. But since the United States has overextended itself and gradually other countries have uh, risen and become more powerful, the United States has become more intolerant more angry, more aggressive, more abusive towards others. And right now what we're seeing in Gaza, I think is a reflection of that. The United States accuses countries across the world of violating human rights, yet we see that it's carrying out what many are now calling a Holocaust and everyone is calling a genocide. This could cannot happen without the consent of the United States. It cannot happen without the support of the Canadian government, the European Union, Australia, and their traditional allies. This simply could not happen. So when the United States goes out of its way to constantly attack China or constantly attack Russia or Iran or any other country that seems to be growing powerful, we have to look at the reality on the ground before we can take them seriously. So as long as as we live in a world where the United States and its allies can massacre people in front of the international community. The, the genocide in Gaza is unique because it's taking place in front of our eyes. We've never had such a thing before. We, in the past, we would hear about it or we would get some details later on. Now we're seeing it practically live. And not only are we seeing it live, but also the countries that are behind it are justifying it. They are giving us their own so-called logic as to why this genocide is taking place. They're blaming the dead babies on the streets that we're seeing day and night. So as long as we have this state of affairs, I think it is necessary for us to have cooperation without involvement of Western countries. That does not mean that we should isolate them or their business people or their business communities or 
they are ordinary, ordinary consumers and people on the streets. But we should not allow these Western governments, these regimes, to have influence over the way in which we do business, the way in which we do trade, the way in which we do cultural exchanges. We have to have a, a, a space where they cannot interfere. And therefore, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, I think, is very important in this regard. BRICS, of course, is extremely important in this regard. And projects such as the Belt and Road Initiative, which uh, is uh, brings the whole of Asia closer to each other and beyond, but also the North-South corridor between Iran and Russia, these will provide opportunities from, for countries in the global South and the non-Western world to finally develop without Western interference, without Western governments being able to use tools such as human rights or global warming or any other uh, of their tools in their toolbox to keep us back, to prevent us from growing and to prevent our people from becoming better off and having better lives. Again, the point is not to marginalize ordinary Westerners. People in the West are just as outraged, for example, as what as we are. We see unprecedented protests across Europe and even North America uh, because of the behavior of their governments and the Israeli regime. But this space, this, the spaces that are now being created are, are promising for the future of people across the global South. They provide opportunities for our children. The United States has for four decades sanctioned my country and increasingly they made it more difficult for people to, to live. The height of those sanctions, of course, came about with Obama and his so-called maximum pressure sanctions, what he called brutal sanctions. He wanted to brutalize the, or he, he, he called them actually crippling sanctions. And later on, Trump called them brutal sanctions. But the objective in for both Biden and Trump, uh, sorry, for Obama and Trump was, was to brutalize and to cripple ordinary Iranians. So as long as the United States and the West have a monopoly over financial institutions, over banks, over the means to trade, as long as they have some sort of veto power over how banks transact with one another, the global South is vulnerable. Our people are vulnerable. And so the more the global South integrates, such as through the Belt and Road Initiative, such as through BRICS, such as through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, ASEAN and others, the more we are able to integrate independently of the West, the better it is for our citizens. Now, Iranians, as they create better ties with Central Asia, neighboring countries, and as countries are increasingly ignoring US sanctions, purchasing Iranian oil, selling goods to Iran, we see life in Iran is gradually becoming better. And I am optimistic, unless some, some major event occurs, that things will continue to get better for ordinary Iranians. Why? Because the United States, the, their ability to strangle ordinary people is gradually eroding. So I think the statements made by the previous speakers, uh, and I'm sure the statements made by uh, the subsequent speakers, all of them will be enlightening into strengthen and, and will strengthen the argument that we should ignore the narratives of the West, and we should think independently. And only when we can think independently can our minds truly be colonized. And only when our minds have truly become decolonized can we think globally and can we think in the interests of the global community. Only then can we look at the East, the West, the North and the South with one set of values. And then I think 
the world that we live in will become a better place. We are living in very dark times. And I think that this darkness will continue for the foreseeable future because of Western powers. But I am optimistic in the long run that things will gradually improve and that people across the globe will have a better future once the hegemon is set aside and begins to recognize that the age of empire is over. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Marandi, for that, uh, for that sort of essentially the, the the call for hope in a time in this very very dark time. And you're absolutely right. The hope is actually taking shape before our eyes, and it's only a question of time before it will realize itself. So thank you so much. Um, we will now go to our next speaker, uh, Senator Mushahid Hussein, who is the founding chairman of the Pakistan China Institute, a think tank which is the premier Pakistani non governmental platform for promoting people to people ties with China. He's also chairman of the Parliamentary Committee on the China Pakistan Economic Corridor, and he was awarded the Five Principles of Peaceful Coexistence Award by President Xi Jinping in April 2015 for his contributions to China Pakistan relations. Mushahid first went to China in 1970 as a young teenager, where, when he headed the Pakistan China Youth Friendship Association, and since then he has made almost 100 visits to, the, to China. China, visiting different places and interacting with the Chinese leadership and, and intelligentsia. So, Senator Hussein, please take the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Desai. And uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and greetings from Islamabad, Pakistan. As always, it's a pleasure to be hosted by the Friends of Socialist China and the International Manifesto Group and especially by my dear friend and comrade, I would say, Keith Bennett, and of course, Carlos, whom I had the privilege of uh, meeting uh, two weeks ago in Beijing at the third Belt and Road Forum. Uh, so I appreciate uh, what they are doing. And I think in this battle of narratives, the battle of ideas, they're playing a very important role based in London and uh, other parts of the West. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it seems that we are really at a very key inflection point uh, when we discuss the uh, scenario of uh, a multipolar world and the role of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, we already are seeing uh, an exorable and probably irreversible shift in the global balance of economic and political and even cultural power away from the West to the East. Uh, the emergence of what many are proclaiming to be the Asian century and the peaceful rise of China, which has its own consequences. As President Xi Jinping rightly said, that uh, we are witnessing once in a century changes uh, that have not been seen before in the last 100 years. And even Western statesmen uh, concur to an extent with that statement because uh, I remember reading an article by Chancellor Olaf Scholz of Germany when he said that uh, we are witnessing epochal tectonic change in the world and what uh, President Macron told the French ambassadors last August in Paris that, uh, and I quote, uh, 300 years of Western hegemony is coming to an end. And I think that is uh, the key element, uh, which was also alluded to uh, by uh, two of the earliest speakers, to who, which I'd like to quote. Professor Zhang Weiwei mentioned that how China has shed its dependency on the West and how uh, they are trying to reform the international order, which was once totally dominated by the United States and the West, whether it was the economic system or the political system, what they used to call or still call the so-called rules-based international order, which they have been willfully violating uh, as and when necessary uh, to promote their parochial interests. And uh, what Professor Radhika Desai also mentioned, uh, I think, and that was also important, that, uh, and I would like to also mention that, that the world faces stark choices. And I think that is the key thing that the BRI is coming in the context of the stark choices that the world faces. And one of the choices are, has already been exercised by Western countries and the United States to which she referred to with, I think, a lot of passion and commitment, namely the Gaza genocide. 
because after the Holocaust and World War II, I think we are witnessing for the first time a systematic slaughter of ethnic cleansing or uh, almost trying to wipe out an entire community by a state uh, uh, using its military force with the full endorsement, concurrence and backing of the self-styled champions of human rights and democracy, namely the United States of America, as well as its allies in Europe and other parts of the West, including particularly Britain. So I think this is quite shameful, it's quite disgraceful, and it also uh, represents uh, uh, the worst kind of hypocrisy and double standards we have seen in recent times. And this is bringing about a very clear cleavage between the global south and the, the global north. And I think when uh, Professor Desai referred to stark choices, the choices are apparent in two very clear statistics that I'd like to briefly present. 10 years of the Belt and Road Initiative has shown $1 trillion of investment in 3,000 projects and uh, with more countries signing in, because I also happen to be in Beijing for the first Belt and Road Forum in 2017, then the second one in 2019, then after COVID, the first one, uh, which was held uh, recently. And I've seen a greater representation and more enthusiasm among countries which are now part of that. So I think that uh, that is one aspect, China's focus on economic development, China's focus on uh, connectivity, China's focus on respect for diversity, equality of relationships and inclusivity as opposed to the United States within the last 20 years, especially after 9-11, spent a whopping $6 trillion in the so-called war on terror. And these are the figures of the Brown University, by the way. These are not my. The Brown University in Rhode Island has given these figures uh, about uh, this uh, uh, cost of war, war uh, study, uh, and this have documented it, which led to a million deaths in most of what is the Middle East of the Muslim world, and uh, 30 million people being displaced and uh, reigning in of uh, 324,000 bombs, drones and missiles on different countries in, the, in that period. So I think uh, it came at a very big human toll. And uh, right next to Pakistan is Afghanistan, which uh, uh, spent uh, $2.2 trillion in the war, which meant that $100 uh, million a day for 20 years in Afghanistan uh, for this war. And you can see the result of that. Coming to the BRI, I think that there's no doubt this is probably the most important developmental and diplomatic initiative of the 21st century, both in terms of scope, size, and speed, and the kind of projects they have indicated. And for me, as a Pakistani, I'm very proud of the fact that Pakistan is a neighbor of China. And China came to Pakistan, as Jin Jing rightly said, at a time when no other country was willing to come in. Ten years ago, there was a lot of conflict. The Americans were in Afghanistan. There was a lot of terrorism in our region, in our country as well. The situation was very volatile. And uh, the uh, Chinese leadership, Xi Jinping personally, and the Communist Party of China, they invested, uh, gave a vote of confidence to the people of Pakistan for the fu economic future. And uh, $26 billion of investment, 250,000 jobs being generated, 8,000 megawatts of electricity in the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, uh, uh, CPEC, uh, which is one of the pivots and the flagship of the Belt and Road Initiative, including the building of the Guada port. And also uh, it has led to changes in the lives of uh, uh, local communities. And I'd just like to mention one uh, aspect of the success story of CPEC and BRI in Pakistan. There's an area called the Thar area, which is a desert close to, uh, in southern province of Sindh, close to the Rajasthan province of India. And uh, that is uh, one region where it has been uh, very less developed. And it's one region where there is a non-Muslim majority, in fact, a Hindu uh, population, Hindu no, Pakistanis are a majority. And for the first time, there, it has led to women empowerment. The women who are living in thatched houses for decades. Uh, they are now driving damper trucks. They are playing a role in uh, the coal mining project, uh, which is mining uh, coal, which is generating electricity, and the electricity is going to the national grid. So these are areas, and uh, similarly, Gawada port in Balochistan has brought about transformative change, 
with the University of Gawada, the Gawada Institute of Vocational Training uh, and Technology and the uh, Park China Friendship Hospital. So these are a host of a uh, number of initiatives that have made a difference in the quality of life of the people at the grassroots level. I think that's uh, what uh, BRI is all about, people-centric development. And in this context, I feel that the best of BRI and the best of CPEC has yet to come because CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic uh, Corridor, is a 15-year project started in 2015 till 2030. And uh, now our prime minister was recently in, uh, also in the uh, Belt and Road Forum and new agreements have been signed for upgradation of our railway system and also developing uh, other areas, especially in agriculture, in IT, in education, and uh, exchange of students and 28,000 Pakistani students are now studying in China. Uh, one thing I'd like to just mention also in this context, uh, when we talk of, uh, and I mentioned during my speeches when I met uh, the Chinese leadership also, and uh, a number of fora which I attended, including the one on people to people, uh, connectivity and the other one on uh, uh, media, that the main uh, challenge which is coming to BRI from outside is that of uh, demonization, fake news, information warfare generation from outside, primarily sponsored by the United States. And they really want to sort of, uh, 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 and already these things have been mentioned uh, before, but this was a, a very clearly evident uh, and this challenge has to be met uh, uh, quite uh, clearly because uh, issues like uh, Xinjiang uh, or South China Sea or Hong Kong or Tibet, they are being uh, used uh, as weapons in the uh, uh, range of information warfare against China by the United States. And I also happened to be in Xinjiang in uh, September and uh, had meetings with the different leadership there in Urumqi, in Kashgar, in Yarkand and even went close to the Pakistani border on the Chinese side, and we could see trucks uh, moving around and a uh, lot of activity. And I've been to Xinjiang about 20 times in the last 10 years, and I've seen this change also of uh, uh, stabler uh, Xinjiang, more prosperous Xinjiang, people quite relaxed also, I think so that they've crossed that initial hump where I think some of the security issues were created from outside China by people trying to play the card of uh, uh, separatism and uh, ethnic fault lines. And it reminded me of an article I'd seen a long time ago in the New York Times, uh, which New York Times uh, article by Leslie Gelb. And he said, and the title of the article was, it's amazing, Professor, you live in the, uh, in, in the West also. And, uh, and very crudely, it said, breaking China apart. This was, that if China does not uh, <laughs> fall in line, so to speak, they said that we can use the kindling of separatism as a card to, uh, so, you know, it's no accident that when you have these fault lines being exploited, they, we know where they're coming from, whether it's uh, Xinjiang or Hong Kong or Tibet. And I think in that context, it is extremely important. I feel that uh, given this context, uh, the United States, and I've been going to the U.S. also because I studied at Georgetown University in Washington, and there were conferences there last year also, and I told them, I said, told the Americans, they said, you guys have missed the bus. China is now far ahead. You cannot try to contain or even compete with China, frankly speaking. And I quoted a study, not, uh, I quoted a scripture, so to speak, uh, the recent study by Professor Graham Hallison in Harvard University. Uh, it's called the uh, Great Tech War, China versus the United States. 52 pages. It's also on the internet. You can Google it. And it says very clearly that, I, and I quote, China is overtaking the United States in high-tech manufacturing, robotics, artificial intelligence, cloud computing, 5G. And uh, uh, Professor Zhang Weiwei showed his latest uh, uh, Huawei Pro Mate. So it's very clear. The final thing I'd like to say is that uh, what Eric said is very clear. Then uh, he said this, uh, and I quote, he said, please do better to the United States and other when you want to compete with the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Ironically, Professor Desai, you know that they uh, criticize the BRI, they attack the BRI, but then they also launch copycat projects with the BRI. Look at the copycat projects in the last few weeks. The B3W Build Back Better World, which uh, Biden announced with a lot of fanfare in March 2021 in Edinburgh at the G8, G7 summit. 
Then after a year, nothing happened. They didn't change the name for Program for Global Infrastructure and Investment, PGII. Not to be left behind, the European Union came with its own plan of a copycat project of BRI, Global Gateway. And recently at the uh, G20 summit in Delhi, uh, hosted by India, they came out with another plan, <laughs> INEC, India, Middle East, uh, European Union Economic uh, Corridor or whatever, including Israel. But that IMEC now lands, uh, is buried under the debris of the Gaza uh, bombings and uh, genocide that has taken place. So oh, basically the US wants to play catch up, but it can't. So we are looking at a world where the, there is a transformation and turbulence also. And as President Xi Jinping said that we are on the right side of history during his speech at the Belt and Road Forum. And I think that is the crux. The world is changing, the power structure is changing, and Asian countries, global public opinion, and the Gaza genocide, including the, I would say, the Ukraine war and the new Cold War with the Americans that are trying to ignite against China, they have all brought about a new fault line, bringing the global south together against what is the global north. And I think that uh, shows, and in that, uh, China is playing a leadership role on issues, whether it was during the pandemic, whether it's climate change, and I feel that uh, hopefully some sanity would prevail in the United States. But the United States system, political system, is now so much captive to Western interests and the election cycle that they have limited vision to see a new world that is emerging out there. I uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. It's a pleasure and delight and uh, always to listen to Professor Radhika Desai and Jiang Weiwei and other friends who have just come and Mr. Marandi from Iran, which is a brotherly country of Pakistan. And we have always opposed uh, sanctions against other countries because we were once also sanctioned in the past, but we managed to beat the sanctions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Senator Hussein. Uh, uh, it was a really a, a very, very uh, lively speech and, and I based, I think, also on your personal experience and I think long, long standing personal engagement with understanding China's international role. Only 50 years. <laughs> Only 50 years. But I'm yes. a student of China. I'm not an expert in China. I'm a well, student of it helps. <laughs> Experts are ultimately students. They have to be. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm now going to ask Fred Mbembe to go. Fred, I hope that's okay uh, and that you can go because uh, Camilla, who should have gone next, uh, is dealing with a technical issue. So hopefully you can go next. I will introduce you first. Fred Mbembe is a Zambian journalist and politician, leader of the Socialist Party of Zambia, former editor of the Zambia Post. He was a Socialist Party's candidate for president in the 2021 Zambian general election and is the recipient of many prestigious awards for his tenacious and courageous journalism. He's a strong advocate of China-Africa friendship and cooperation and has been powerful in his denunciation of Western slanders of that relationship. So Fred, I hope uh, um, we are not dis inconveniencing you too much by asking you to go now. Please go ahead if you can. Thank you very much. Greetings friends and comrades. There's a growing evidence that leading players in the non-West, sometimes collectively called the global South, are increasingly impatient with the underhand way the West casts the dice in its favor in playing the game of world economics. The West must The West must let others develop while seeking their own further development. They must let others live better while aspiring to live better and better themselves. They must let others feel secure while seeking to increase or improve their own security. We have done things their way for too long. For all these centuries, we have been on the path chosen by them. We have done things their way. But look at where we are today. 
and look at where they are today. Certainly new approaches, new initiatives like BRI are needed in these new times. And of course, in a new way. We can't continue decorating our tomorrows with their yesterdays. There has been so much propaganda about the BRI, that the BRI is a debt trap. Instead, the BRI makes it possible for us to industrialize and to get out of the waste debt trap. It's not a debt trap. However, it is important for us to realize that the implementation of BRI is far from being perfect. There are many legitimate concerns and challenges being raised in this implementation. The implementation of these projects and these programs in Africa. There are issues about environmental degradation. There are issues of unfair and just and unacceptable labor practices. There are issues about exploitative fishing and so on and so forth. It is important for China to listen more, not only to the government concerns and business concerns, but also to listen more to the people's concerns. The workers' unions, the peasant organizations, the socialist or left parties, and so on and so forth. I believe after 10 years of experience, after 10 years of experiment and expansion, BRI now will get into a new period of more intentional governance and more regression. It is important for the West not to compete with China on these issues. There's need for cooperation. Competing projects, competing programs will not take us anywhere. And the reason need to realize that this planet on, all, on which all of us depend for survival requires that it's good for all of us. If it's only good for a few of us to live on, it will never be good for all of us to live on or for any of us to live on. They can go on with the propaganda after propaganda against China and the BRI. But if they do not put anything in place that makes our lives better, that improves the living conditions of our people, that gives us a chance to industrialize and develop, that propaganda will not yield anything. Those lies and the deceit will evaporate very quickly. It's not possible for us to continue on this path. We have been on this path since the early 1900s or the late 1800s. Look where we are today. Should we continue on this path? Who led us on this path? It's, the, it's themselves the West and the institutions they control, the World Bank and the IMF. Quite often have advised us to take this path. They don't want us to deal with China in the way we are dealing with China. But which is a better deal? The one we have with China or their deal that we have had for centuries? We are not trying to revive the wrongs of history. We can forget all the issues of slave trade and so on, and just deal with the current issues. Where does it leave us? If we continue to deal with them, the way they are dealing with us today, forgetting about the way they dealt with us yesterday, can we develop in this way? Their lives are getting better and better and better. Well, our lives are getting worse and worse and worse. 
they are becoming richer and richer and richer. We are becoming poorer and poorer and poorer and more desperate. Should we continue with a system that is continually impoverishing us and enriching them? Yes, they want it to continue because it's enriching them. But we don't want this to continue because it's continually impoverishing us. Poverty is growing in our countries. Despite all the programs to eliminate it, to reduce it, poverty is growing. Hunger is growing. Unemployment is growing. Our environment is being degraded continually. Surely, you don't need to be very intelligent. A little intelligence is all you need to realize that this system is not working for us. It's working for them, but it's not working for us. We have helped them attain very high levels of, of, of life, high standards of living at our own expense. For how long should we continue with that? The BRA, for all its deficiencies, for all its weaknesses, gives us a better opportunity than anything we have had in our history or in the history of humanity. This is the best initiative we have ever seen. Today, wherever you go in Africa, the main infrastructure is a product of this initiative over the last 10 years. And probably even before, as my comrade pointed out, the Tazara Rail. How do we turn our backs on something that is working for us and proceed in the direction of what is not working for us? These are the challenges. You can push ideological concerns aside, but just the being a rational human being, we need the solidarity that China is offering. We need that solidarity. The knowledge and the experiences of all human beings should reach all others. We believe this is the highest political thought ever reached by human beings. When they started to realize that the experience and knowledge of others reach all others. This is the basis of the Chinese socialism, the socialism with Chinese characteristics. It's not a devoid of solidarity. There is a realization that this planet on which we live cannot be peaceful, cannot be prosperous for only a small group of us and continue to be that way. If we need a peaceful world, we have to make everybody have the chance to live in peace. Peace for a small group can't work. As we are seeing in Gaza, peace for the Israelis alone can't work. Prosperity for the Israelis alone can't work. If that peace is not enjoyed by the Palestinian people, if that prosperity in that region is enjo not enjoyed by the Palestinian people, we will see the eruption we are seeing. They can bomb and bomb and bomb and bomb. They can try to exterminate the Palestinian people, but they will not solve the problem. Even one Palestinian who remains will cause them problems, will not accept to live forever under those conditions. Similarly, we are rejecting the current world economic order. It's not working for us. It's not taking us anywhere. If they think they can change it in a way that works, let them come and show us the way the BRI is showing us. We are not blind followers of China. The Chinese are our friends, and we love what China is doing in the world. But it's not blind love. It's love that comes with loyalty to each other. It's love that comes with respect for each other. It's, come, it's love that comes with compassion for others. This is the world that we need. We have lived in the bipolar world, the world dominated by the Soviet Union and the USA. We used to think it's a bad world. 
we used to think it's a cruel world. But today, we have seen a much more worse world, that which is dominated by one country, the United States. Again, we are rejecting that. We need a plural system in the world. We need a multipolar world. We need a world in which all of us can participate, can live in dignity. Not this world, and not that other world. I have had the, the, the opportunity of personal experience in that. We don't want that world. We want this world which China is sharing with us today, which China is participating in shaping. We need a more just, more fair, more humane, more peaceful world. But again, we realize that this world will not come on its own. We have to struggle for it because there are those who are benefiting from the current world economic order. They will not give up their privileges without a fight. And that's why you are seeing them creating wars everywhere, creating turmoil everywhere, creating tensions everywhere because they don't want to lose their privileges. They have put up their militaries almost in every part of this planet. They claim the respect of sovereignty, but at the same time, they are creating divisions. They don't even respect the sovereignty of China over the territory of Taiwan. Uh, one minute, Fred. They say they, uh, one they say they accept one China. Yes, they say they accept, they accept the policy of one China, but at the same time, they treat Taiwan as a separate country where they can go and do what they want, which they can arm in whichever way they want, and the arm against China, the country to which Taiwan belongs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fred. I think you put it so well. The world must go, is going, with its eyes wide open towards the pluripolar world that we need. Thank you so much. Uh, really very well said. Um, our next speaker is Camilla Escalante. She's a Canadian journalist who reports on Latin America and is currently based in Nicaragua. She is the co-founder of Cosocho News, an outlet, outlet launched during the coup in Bolivia, and her reporting can be found in places such as Press TV, Telesur, uh, Telesur English rather, and FAIR, or Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. Camilla, please go ahead. Thank you, Radhika, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, to celebrate those 10 years of BRI. Well, we're living in a profoundly indignant time and we're seeing um, everywhere in the world, but I can speak for Latin America, the failed responses of our governments and the dissonance between the majorities in Latin America on the one hand and our governments, which have acted really slowly, not because it, they're being cautious uh, in the face of a changing world, but Seemingly because of uh, lack of direction, um, I, I wouldn't want to go further than that. But there are some really um, difficult problems that we're facing. And sometimes I think that these governments, uh, to generalize the governments of Latin America, have contempt for us. Um, and just to speak uh, generally, but nevertheless... Um, it, it, it becomes insulting at one point that our advances move so slowly. And we've heard so much in the way of uh, talk about a tide of progressive governments. Everyone wants to celebrate that we've had so many elections of so-called progressive uh, and leftist leaders in recent years. Um, but I don't fully subscribe to that analysis. And I think we have great challenges ahead of us in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I think that, you know, I bear some responsibility in, uh, you know, pushing back and sharing, uh, you know, some of my uh, views on, on this and pushing it back against the blind, um, unchecked optimism, because things are only optimistic if we're actually moving in the right direction. So we have a long ways to go in Latin America. You know, salaries continue to be low here. Living conditions are humble for the average person. Uh, 
we don't have equitable access to technology as compared with countries like China, with countries like Europe and North America that have uh, really hindered our right to development uh, throughout all of these centuries. And there's still a massive discrepancy in the way school children learn here in Latin America um, and so forth. And so uh, the mere election of these progressive governments doesn't convert a country into one that exudes progress. Uh, we are not uh, just the mere election of a government doesn't uh, allow us to uh, move in the direction of, of China, for example, just because we elected these people. Unfortunately, we it feels like we're stumped at some points, at some times. And so, you know, few countries in our in our region have actually managed to free themselves from the Monroe Doctrine. Um, and, you know, that arrangement of dominion, that arrangement of domination primarily by the United States. And when you see how much China and other countries have achieved um, and knowing the reality um, of how people live uh, on a whole in the United States and Europe, it's a little discouraging and it feels like we're just moving very slowly in our development. And so the certainty and the blueprint that's provided by China and the BRI is the silver lining. It's unfortunate, I would say. Um, it's it's something to celebrate, but it's unfortunate that uh, that we don't necessarily have other means other than um, at uh, joining forces with these other world powers, specifically, of course, uh, Russia and Iran, um, in addition to China. And so, uh, many important infrastructures have been recently uh, infrastructure projects have been recently signed between the Nicaraguan government and the government of China um, and Chinese companies all uh, within uh, the last year and a half really as Nicaragua um, relaunched relationships, reopened relationships with China following that period in which uh, since the neoliberal uh, governments, Nicaragua had that relation with China. And so things are, are moving very quickly. And so some of the most important infrastructure projects that we're seeing now are the construction of an international airport, um, a railway, two hydroelectric projects, a thermal project, and more roads and new public transport units. These are all very important. And just to use Nicaragua as an example, because of course, um, you know, there are almost all countries in Latin America and the Caribbean have joined uh, the BRI and the maybe two that haven't have BRI projects, uh, but it is going to really transform the government or transform Nicaragua as a country because of the way in which this country already has uh, some very important uh, things. It has uh, economic and political stability and is very attractive uh, right now to foreign investment. And I think it's, it's, uh, that that uh, high degree of trust between the two governments is going to allow for things to really uh, develop very uh, quickly. And so the railway uh, building was was one of the most recent announcements. Nicaraguan government um, officials uh, recently announced that they're going to be uh, building a railway with uh, China, um, which will become the country's main commercial route. And um, there's actually two uh, railway mega projects that will be uh, linking different cities. Um, Nicaragua is also advancing in a deep water port project in the Nicaraguan Caribbean. And as that advances, the government will work with Chinese state companies to build these cross country railways to serve the interests of Nicaragua and the Nicaraguan people and the needs of Nicaragua right now, but also to be put at the service of companies and uh, international transactions for inter-oceanic trade, uh, tr trade transactions for the entire continent, for the entire region, particularly given the reality of the difficulties of the Panama Canal related to climate change uh, and other, other factors. And this option right now of building the the railway across Nicaragua um, is the most viable and it has the most potential for success that exists uh, right now in Central America and our region in general. So it's very exciting to say the least. And this is why the United States uh, right now is pursuing Nicaragua with such a high degree of hostility and aggression 
and uh, unfortunately to the silence of many governments of the region. They're also improving uh, public transportation. Nicaragua has partnered with both Russia and China, but most recently uh, a couple uh, fleets of Chinese uh, buses that have been purchased have arrived in the country. These are modern buses. The buses that the regular people use in Nicaragua for mass public transit are extraordinarily old. They're older than I am. Um, and they have a lot of problems to say the least. And so obviously at a, a low cost, a very fair cost, Nicaragua has been able to acquire all of those vehicles and is very quickly uh, getting rid of, in no time at all, practically overnight, getting rid of the old vehicles and bringing in these new Chinese vehicles um, to, to update our public transport uh, system. Um, it, it's, it's a huge advance. People are very happy about that. Um, and a new airport. So we, we recently, uh, very recently, this is all happening right now, but heard the announcement um, in the come, or sorry, of the uh, a contract for the reconstruction, expansion, and improvement of the uh, Punta Huete International Airport. And it is a, it's a terminal that will become the main international airport for the country. It's expected in the first three years to manage um, almost 4 million passengers, uh, and 2,000 flights in a year, and it's going to have a much longer uh, runway, which is not which is not possible to expand at the main international airport in Managua right now. Um, this is going to be in a really good optimal location with um, uh, harmony for the environment, and it'll allow Nicaragua to further open internationally. It's really important, among other things, including investment and uh, and business. Nicaragua actually does need, uh, it does uh, require a bit of tourism to sustain its economy. It is very important. I don't, I don't know that people know that uh, tourism is such an important factor, but it is really important. The government does want to invite people here. Um, it's a beautiful country with high degrees of security and safety, and it, but it does need that critical infrastructure. And this airport uh, will be very important to that. Um, what the country has right now is this legendary small airport in Managua, the Augusta, Augusto C. Centino Airport, um, with tiny airport and, like I said, a short runway. So this is going to be a huge advance. Um, also, Nicaragua and China, uh, it's important to say, signed a free trade agreement in August, and it was negotiated in under a year. Um, it's the most important bi uh, achievement in the bilateral uh, cooperation since the resumption of diplomatic relations, and it's expected to further stimulate the potential investment uh, and trade co and cooperation and open for broader uh, uh, prospects for uh, cooperation between the two countries. Uh, recently, marking the 10-year uh, anniversary of the BRI, uh, CGTN spoke with Michael Campbell. Michael Campbell uh, was a very, very important uh, minister here in Nicaragua. He's now the ambassador in Beijing. And he uh, he spoke to CGTN and, you know, they uh, he was asked why it was so uh, distinct, this relationship between Nicaragua and China. And he said that because of the history of interventionism and aggressions from the United States and other countries, um, that Nicaragua hasn't been able to take full advantage of the geographic location and natural resources. But now with working with China, um, there are, uh, we can see those important efforts to, to become the Nicaragua that we really want, he says, and, um, and that it's really important for the growth, not only of Nicaragua, but of the Central American region. He said that um, in the case of Latin America and the Caribbean, one second, it's a little loud. In the case of Latin America and the Caribbean, because of projects like the BRI, um, trade and foreign direct investment between the region and China has grown exponentially. Trade represents $450 billion in 2021, and it has to do so because of China's uh, respectful engagement and cooperation based on solidarity and mutual respect. It's creating important opportunities. He said this was never provided by the United States and the Monroe Doctrine. Unfortunately, that was um, that was uh, Ambassador Michael Campbell, uh, the Nicaraguan ambassador in Beijing. And so, um, you know, the the United States is very concerned about the the ways in which things are very quickly changing in our region. 
our region has quickly established ties with China in recent years. Panama in 2017, uh, El Salvador in 2018. That was I'm under the FML. Million. That was under the FML FMNL. FMLN government, um, and of course, most recently, Honduras. Um, and so the government of uh, Xiomara Castro is quickly building a comprehensive agenda with China uh, since the opening of ties uh, this year. And that's been um, extraordinarily important. We're seeing those um, those uh, agreements being signed uh, today with the uh, foreign minister of Honduras, I think, was back in Beijing this week, and uh, and they are also working to negotiate a free trade agreement. So these are some of the exciting things that are taking place. Uh, you know, to to put a focus on, on Central America and not uh, South America so much as we normally see, but it has been an extremely important uh, last couple of years in terms of strengthening that relationship and is providing, like I said, that silver lining um, and a sense of optimism. Um, for the way in which we can potentially uh, really begin to advance from not just celebrating mere elections of progressives, but really uh, put forth a concrete agenda uh, towards really fixing things with, that, that are wrong, things that are lagging behind, and move forward in this supposed multipolar world that's coming. Thanks so much, Camilla, or such a very grounded view from Nicaragua, from this wonderful lush country that you are in, that we can see behind you. Uh, that was really great. Uh, so we are now uh, to our second last speaker, who is Martin Jakes. Uh, Martin is a leading China expert in the English speaking world and author of the global bestseller, When China Rules the World, The End of the Western World and the Birth of a New Global Order, which was first published in 2009 and since been translated into 15 languages and has sold over 350,000 copies. Martin has held visiting professorships and fellowships at Tsinghua University, Fudan University, Renmin University, and the National University of Singapore. And for several years, he was senior fellow at the Department of Politics and International Studies at Cambridge University. So Martin, please go ahead. Uh, Martin? Yeah, it's not letting me. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Radhika. Um, nice to see you and everyone again. Um, when the Belt and Road Initiative was first launched 10 years ago, there was much puzzlement. What is it? Was a widely asked question. And quite reasonably so, because Belt and Road was like nothing we had seen before. This was not a plan with fixed dates. There was nothing concrete. There were no boundaries. There was no end date. In every sense, it was open-ended. It was an idea, a concept. It was a totally new and original way of thinking about a project. Furthermore, it was on the hugest of scales, encompassing the great majority of the world's population. We had never seen anything like this before. The point of departure for the idea of Belt and Road was a reflection on China's own transformation. What lessons might be drawn from it for the developing world? What could the developing countries learn from it? At the heart of China's transformation was state-led large-scale investment in infrastructure. If it worked for China, then why not for others? Most of the Eurasian landmass, together with Africa and Latin America, suffered from a disabling shortage of infrastructure. Belt and Road would seek to change that. China would be the hub of the project. It would consist of a multitude of bilateral agreements between China and the developing countries, with China providing a lot of the funding, typically in the form of loans. The response over the last 10 years has been enormous, with around maybe 150 countries now part of Belt and Road. If many scratch their heads in puzzlement about Belt and Road when it was first announced, this has long ceased to be the case. 
everyone now knows in varying degrees what it is about. In 10 short years, it has become part of the global geo-economic firmament, no less than the IMF and the World Bank. Let's remind ourselves where China was in 2013, 10 years ago, when it was launched. It was in the process of emerging from the Deng Xiaoping era, during which the overriding priority had been China's own economic development. It was quiescent on the global stage, seeking to keep a low profile, a rule taker, not a rule maker, criticized in the West for its passivity, famous for its extraordinary economic growth rate, but not for its international initiatives, which it sought to avoid. Little did we know at the time, but the launch of Belt and Road was to signal a huge shift in China's relationship with the world. It marked the moment of China's coming out, and it was to prove remarkably successful. It is not an exaggeration to argue that over the decade of its existence, it has changed the world. If it, it is difficult to overestimate, reflecting on Belt and Road, the, its historical significance. I want to argue that in four ways, it represented a transformatory moment. First, it signals a fundamental shift in China's own economic geography. Ever since the decline of the Silk Roads and the rise of Europe, China's economy has been overwhelmingly concentrated on its eastern and southern seaboards, a state of affairs greatly magnified in the period after 1978, when the economic reform, reforms led to a huge increase in maritime trade with the United States and Europe. In contrast, in the heyday of the Silk Roads, the most advanced part of China was situated in central China. The Silk Roads began from near Xi'an in Shanxi province and traveled westwards across Central Asia and beyond, acting as China's main point of connection with the outside world. With the launch of Belt and Road, China is in the process of reconnecting itself with Eurasia. The central and western parts of China will again become much more important rather than being relative economic backwaters as they are now. In the process, Belt and Road marks China's transformation from a regional into a global power of a new kind. Second, Belt and Road heralds the beginning of a renaissance of the Eurasian continent, which suffered a huge decline during the age of the West as a result of the rise of Europe at its far Western end and the latter's subsequent mission to colonize much of Eurasia and remake most of the world in its imperial image. For two centuries, even the term Eurasia faded into historical obscurity. Its return to contemporary common usage being a very recent phenomenon, intimately bound up with the launch of Belt and Road. It is destined to return to something like its previous global importance. In the process, its own economic and political geography will go through a profound transformation consequent on Eurasia's economic revolution. Boundaries and categories such as the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia, South Asia and East Asia will become blurred and transformed. The Middle East, subject to many boundary changes since the end of colonialism, will be home to much reinvention. Africa, likewise, will undergo profound changes perhaps acquiring a number of distinctive regional identities. 
Southeast Asia, now virtually synonymous with the term ASEAN, will acquire a new global prominence and authority as a new kind of model and exemplar. The star of Europe in, in the star of Europe in relative economic and absolute dem demographic decline will continue to fade and matter increasingly less. The main shapers of change will be the new rising powers and identities. The main losers will be countries and identities in decline, most obviously Europe and the United States, the latter having set itself on exclusion and isolation from Belt and Road and the Eurasian continent. Third, there will be a huge shift in power away from the traditional developed world, United States, Western Europe, and Japan. The sh this shift has been underway since, uh, underway since the beginning of post-war decolonization and finds eloquent expression in the fact that the developing world now accounts for two thirds of global GDP compared with the developed world's one third. And the fact that this process is still very much in its early stages. The expansion of BRICS from six to 11 members last August was a key moment in this process. It marked the arrival of the global South as a major player on the global stage. The failure of Western policy towards the developing world and the success of Belt and Road signals the birth of an entirely new developmental strategy. Likewise, we will witness the growing influence of a new political vocabulary rooted in the history, experience, priorities, and aspirations of the developing world. Development, civilization, reparations, new and experimental forms of governments, governance, and a new geography, to mention but a few. My fourth and final point is this. We should not expect Belt and Road to converge or increasingly resemble what might be described as the Western Bloc. Since the inception of Belt and Road in 2013, and indeed much earlier, it has been clear that not only was China very different from the West, but it would remain very different and would become in some respects even more different from the habitual, from the universal and habitual use of WeChat to con the continuing importance of state-owned enterprises and the commitment to protecting social norms and values from the worst excesses of the market as reflected in the policy of common prosperity. Chinese modernity is very distinct from Western modernity and will continue to be. Indeed, the gap is likely to widen. This is not a function of China's backwardness, but a product of history and the direction of its modernization. Given China's huge importance in Belt and Road, we can expect the Belt and Road countries, and not just China, to reflect in varying degrees some of the characteristics of Chinese modernity and thereby also be markedly different from the Western bloc. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Martin. That was really, I have to say, visionary in the sense that you connected the long, long gone past, the, 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 you connected the significance of China and its initiatives, putting it in the long run history, as well as looking forward into the future as to what we could expect. Really lovely. Thank you so much. Um, finally, we turn to our last but not least uh, speaker, Keith Bennett. Keith is co-editor of the co-organizer of this uh, uh, webinar, uh, co-editor of the Friends of Socialist China website, and convener of the International Manifesto Group's editorial committee. Uh, he graduated from London University School of Oriental and African Studies in 79, having studied history and politics and focused chiefly on China from 1840 onwards. And on graduation, he worked for the Society for Anglo-Chinese Understanding, or SACU for short. He first visited China in 1981 and has been there dozens of times since. He has worked in journalism, politics, and the private sector, always retaining a focus on China and other socialist countries. So, Keith, please go ahead. 
Uh, thank you, Radhika. And first, on behalf of Friends of Socialist China, I'd like to thank all those who registered for, attended and supported our webinar today. Special thanks must go to our really brilliant, truly brilliant speakers who from five continents have shared their insights with us on the Belt and Road Initiative. And thanks also to our co-organizers, the International Manifesto Group, as well as our sponsors, Connolly Books, Critical Theory Workshop, Geopolitical Economy Research Group, Geopolitical Economy Report, Hampton Institute, uh, the International Action Center, Iskra Books, Kuwasacha News, Peace, Land and Bread, Pivot to Peace, and Veterans for Peace, China Working Group. It is, as we've heard, 10 years since President Xi Jinping first put forward the Belt and Road Initiative, and therefore surely a good time to take stock and make an initial summing up. Last month, like some of the other speakers today, I was privileged to be seated in Beijing's Great Hall of the People to listen to President Xi open the third Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation, his speech being followed by those of President Putin and the presidents of Kazakhstan, Indonesia and Argentina, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia and the Secretary General of the United Nations. As President Xi noted, in the course of its first decade, Belt and Road cooperation has extended from its initial focus on the Eurasian landmass to Africa, Latin America and elsewhere. Indeed, more than 150 countries and over 30 international organizations have signed Belt and Road cooperation documents. Through this process, he explained, Belt and Road cooperation has progressed from sketching the outline to filling in the details and blueprints have been turned into real projects. Xi Jinping said that over the past decade, we have learned that humankind is a community with a shared future. China can only do well when the world is doing well. When China does well, the world will get even better. President Xi, in my view, expresses things here with such simplicity and clarity, making it sound like obvious common sense, that it might seem that this is acceptable to all and that nobody could possibly disagree with it. But this is far from the case. The BRI is concerned with development, modernization, and globalization. And there are two fundamentally different approaches to these questions in today's world. It is not a coincidence that the approach to these questions that represents and embodies the interests of the overwhelming majority of countries and the overwhelming majority of the people in every country should be put forward by the world's leading socialist country. Nor is it a coincidence that it is above all the world's leading imperialist country that announces, as we've heard from other speakers, a supposed alternative to the BRI every few months, none of which achieve any traction or any concrete result. Lu Jianchao, the Minister of the International Department of the Communist Party of China's Central Committee, spelled matters out clearly in a recent article where he wrote, the vision of building a global community of building a human community with a shared future and the three global initiatives are scientific they encapsulate they encapsulate the stances viewpoints and methods of marxism reflecting the hallmarks of marxism and demonstrating salient theoretical character underpinned by dialectical and historical materialism the vision and the three global initiatives reveal the laws governing the development of human society and its future direction. Careful study of the white paper released by the Information Office of China's State Council on October 10 to coincide with the 10th anniversary and the Beijing Forum can help to understand this more concretely. And all the documents to which I refer may be read in full on our website along with useful introductions. The white paper again makes clear that whilst the, whilst the BRI has been launched by China, it belongs to the world and benefits the whole of humanity. Irrespective of size, strength and wealth, all countries participate on equal terms. Making very clear the distinction between the socialist and imperialist approaches to such questions, it notes that the type of development advanced by the BRI diverges from the exploitative colonialism of the past avoids coercive and one-sided transactions, rejects the centre-periphery model of dependency, and refuses to displace crisis onto others 
or exploit neighbors for self-interest. The same point was made even more forcefully by President Xi Jinping in his report to the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China in October last year, where he stated, in pursuing modernization, China will not tread the old path of war, colonization and plunder taken by some countries. That brutal and bloodstained path of enrichment at the expense of others caused great suffering for the people of developing countries. These words of President Xi surely acquire even greater relevance and poignancy today in the face of Israel's genocidal war in Gaza and the courageous resistance of the Palestinian people, a veritable 21st century Warsaw Ghetto. On the one hand, the United States, Britain, France and Germany aid and abet the genocide and even seek to curtail and deny their own people's right to protest. On the other hand, socialist China, along with the overwhelming majority of the countries of the world, principally the global south, and as seen in the recent United Nations General Assembly vote, stand for peace and end to the war of aggression and the long overdue realization of the national rights to an independent state of the Palestinian people. And the same distinction with regard to which road to take informs socialist China's approach to globalization. In the Western countries, the prevailing discourse from much of both the left and the right tends to assert that China has wholeheartedly embraced the model of globalization advanced by the major capitalist powers. This is so far from reality as to suggest that those who advance it are either ignorant or malicious, or quite possibly both. The white paper is clear that the fruits of economic globalization have until now been dominated by a small group of developed countries. Rather than contributing to common prosperity at a global level, it continues, globalization has widened the wealth gap between the rich and poor, between developed and developing countries, and within the developed countries themselves. Many developing countries have benefited little from economic globalization and even lost their capacity for independent development. Certain countries, it notes, have practiced unilateralism, protectionism, and hegemonism. But just as in their day, Marx and Engels could not endorse, but rather repudiated and stood against the Luddite approach, which, faced with the undoubted depredations and cruelties of the Industrial Revolution, sought to reverse the objective course of historical progress, China, unlike some, does not reject globalization but it stands for a different globalization. Economic globalization, the white paper insists, remains an irreversible trend. It is unthinkable for countries to return to a state of seclusion or isolation, but economic globalization must undergo adjustments in both form and substance. The focus of BRI, it explains, is precisely on contributing to a form of globalization that generates common prosperity and that brings benefits, particularly to developing countries. Thus, while the BRI is open to all, it is neither accident nor coincidence that the majority of its participants are developing countries. The developing countries as a whole all seek to leverage their collective strength to address, to address such challenges as inadequate infrastructure, lagging industrial development, and insufficient capital, technologies, and skills so as, to, so as to promote their economic and social development. Grounded as it is, therefore, in the stand, viewpoint and method of Marxism, it should be clear that the BRI is based on and inherits not only the Silk Roads of antiquity, but also the diplomatic history of socialist China, as well as the international standpoint and practice of the international working class movement more generally, particularly since the establishment of worker states, that is the constitution of the working class as the ruling class. It resonates, for example, with China's building of the Tazara Railway in Zambia and Tanzania in the 1970s, about which Li Jingjing spoke in detail and with so, such passion and eloquence and inspiring detail. 
with the five principles of peaceful coexistence put forward by Premier Zhou Enlai in 1954, and the 10 principles adopted by the Afro-Asian Conference held in the, Indianese, in the Indonesian city of Bandung the following year. As far back as 1921, even before the official formation of the USSR, Lenin's government concluded treaties with Afghanistan, Persia, as it was then called, and Turkey, which provided for mutual support, aid in the financial, technical, personnel, and other fields, and especially for support in their struggles to win and maintain independence from colonial and imperial powers. This, in turn, built on the deliberations of the Second Congress of the Communist International, held in 1920, which established the absolute duty of the working class movement to support the struggles of the colonial and oppressed countries and peoples for liberation and for independence against imperialism. The Belt and Road Initiative and the other global initiatives put forward by President Xi Jinping are the 21st century inheritance and expression of this Marxist theory and practice. The difference is that today it is becoming a material force that is progressively uniting and mobilizing the majority of humanity. This is surely a major part of why President Xi constantly reminds us that we are presently witnessing changes unseen in a century, that is, since the birth of the first worker state. In Friends of Socialist China, we will continue to pay the closest attention to these developments. Thank you again for your support today, and we hope to continue working with you. Thank you so much, Keith, for, for bringing such a, our event to uh, such a wonderful end. I thought you your, your speech was very important in uh, distinguishing, you know, in essentially countering the argument that China is engaged in some form of imperialism. You also, I think, very usefully separated what the West means by globalization from what China means by globalization. And I'm also reminded, you know, that and also Ma Martin's speech as well, when he go, w went back and reminded us of where things were just 10 years ago, that when I was a graduate student, all you could hear about is the end of uh, the development project, you know, the third world in crisis, development is no longer possible, etc. And a couple of short decades later, the whole scene had changed massively, precisely, thanks uh, to China and China's intervention, the survival of socialism in China and uh, the thriving of socialism in China really uh, is there at this point to, to, to light the way. And I think also initiatives like the BRI are there to lead the way towards a pluripolar world uh, and to eventually to socialism. So um, I think all the speakers have just given absolutely fantastic talks. I hope very much that, uh, that you will all who are here share it widely. Uh, thanks again to the organizers. This primarily was Carlos's work, so thank you, Carlos. Uh, thanks also to everyone else uh, for, for all the people who have attended. Thanks to uh, videographer Paul and 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 and, and uh, everyone else. Anyway, thank you very much, and hope to get together very soon and continue these very important discussions because. Uh, we may be living in dark times, but as speakers, various speakers have pointed out, we are also we also have hope to hold out. Thank you very much and goodbye.